I think these conversations are a great way to to try to better understand the other side. So I, I hope in, in that spirit, um, we, we can have a very fruitful conversation led by um, Rabbi Amichai Laulavi. Thank you very much for being here. Please join us, Amichai. And he will be leading this conversation with, as I mentioned, the editor of the film, who's been very involved with the entire process, Vasaf Lapid, um, as well as the producer of the film, Rotem Faran. Thank you both for being here. Applause for all. Thank you. I've just seen the film for the first time, as I assume many of us have. Um, I want to thank you for a very complicated and well crafted film and for your work you. on this. Um, I'm not sure where this conversation will go. I want to say something very personal. As somebody who's been living in New York for 20 years, who grew up in Israel, uh, in a Zionist Jewish home, who served in the army, whose um, father served, um, father came from Poland in 1945 as a Holocaust refugee, joined the Haganah. We don't exactly know where he was in 48. And uh, living with a lot of memories and living with a lot of conflicting narratives and uh, working as many of us do to make sense and make peace. The peace that you brought here, both the personal story of Dro and his mother and whoever had the thought of building Far Shaul on the ruins of Dir Yassin, um, it's a haunting piece. The line that stays with me is what Dror is saying at some point. The truth is bound to come out. So um, I know for many of us who are here, um, there are many questions. Some of them will not be answered. Um, and I think 70 years after what happened there, some of these questions ought to be asked. Some truths will and ought to be heard. And um, if forgiveness can exist in a cruel world, somewhere in response to this and so many other stories, there is a lot of forgiveness to be asked and ideally very courageously and generously to be given. All sides, all stories. But I think your story between the personal trauma of this family and the larger trauma of our greater families, you've touched something very raw. So um, I'm going to not share my thoughts. The night is young for many more conversations. I know that both of you have maybe something to share about what it means for you as Israelis to bring the story to us tonight. And then we'll open it um, for your questions and comments, knowing that uh, in Q&As such as these, uh, short is yeah. better and questions are better than statements. But I'm sure we all have a lot in our heart that some of it can be handled here. So before we turn to the to the audience, anything you want to share or stuff about seeing it here, about the process, about the work? Yeah, of course. Uh, good evening, first of all. Thank you for coming. And thank you for the festival, and all the members for having us here. Um, I think that it's very important to see the film uh, outside of Israel. Um, because I think that not many people know about DRC, even though I think half of the audience rose their hands before, but don't think many people know about DRC. And I think that the evidence that are shown in the film and all the consequences that <coughs> comes out of this story is, um, I think it's very important to people to, to hear about, because I think if I have to summarize the film in a way, I think denial is not an answer or forgetting is not an answer. So I think sharing this story with other people in a way is a good uh, step forward, even though I think we have a lot of steps to move, but it's a beginning. Um, and this is my statement for now. I also wanted to say thank you for everyone who came. For us, it's very exciting to screen the film outside of Israel and to hear your comments and your feedback. Um, this is the, the US premiere, and we're very happy to answer questions if you have any. We have a question right up here. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Bakri. 
I thank you very much for this courageous film, honest and painful. I believe that this desire of telling your truth give me a great hope that I have partners in my country, in Israel. I was born there. And I had a very hard time since I did the film Jenin Jenin 15 years ago. I still pay the price until now, until this moment. And my wife and my children keeping telling me, didn't you lose your hope? Are you crazy? You think you will change the Israelis? Tonight, you prove to me that I can change the Israelis with such kind film like this. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, just a small statement. Hope is, I think, everything that we've got right now. And I've seen your film like 15 years ago, a few times. Um, it had a great influence on me as, as a filmmaker, as an as a person, as an Israeli. And I hope people like you and perhaps us and other filmmakers can make a bridge that maybe will lead other people towards a better future. But I really hope it can, can be very, uh, in, in, in the near future, I hope. Is it on? Uh, the film is very well made. It's two stories, obviously, but I want to ask you a question. I came purposely to see this. Did, did you see this by the BBC, The Fifty Years' War? You ever seen this? Anybody ever seen this? The Fifty Years' War by the BBC. It has contrary evidence by Arabs who survived, who actually said that when they were taken to Jerusalem, they got out of the lorries at the Damascus Gate, and then this fellow, Sari Nusabai, was the head of Palestine Broadcasting. He's claimed that Dr. Khalidi came to him and said, you have to say that there was a massacre. You have to say that the Jews bayoneted women with babies, OK? And then they said there was no massacre. It was a battle. And he all, they also say how when the Lehi approached, they brought a truck with a loudspeaker. It's all in the film. and. They tried to warn, they warned the people to leave the village. And then a sniper on top of the Mukhtar's house started shooting, okay? And they, these two Arab survivors, which if you get this, you can see it, they say there was no massacre, it was a battle. And when the BBC introduced, they started saying, I, I think actually basically what you're saying, here. if I may, I'm hearing you. I'm sure that there are many perspectives. This is 70 years ago. There were eyewitnesses. There's photos that are in the archive that we might not see in our lifetime. As you know, this and other stories have many perspectives. What the truth is, it's hard to tell. What I think was so powerful about the film, as you said, that it asks the question. There are conflicting eyewitnesses. There are survivors, massacre or battle, Whatever is left there right now, as I said, is a monument to the atrocities of war, to this lingering conflict, and a hope to get beyond the trauma. And what we will know, this is not the forum to solve the factual history of what happened in Dir Yassin, whether it's the BBC version of this film. Let's agree that on this issue, many disagree. And let's find a way beyond what happened to making peace and moving on with respect. Do the filmmakers want to add anything to this? No, we, we, we won't argue about details, even though the speaker issue, um, they all said that the speaker truck uh, was stuck like 20 kilometers from the village. They all wow. said that uh, we won't, uh, but I won't get there. I think that Rabbi Amichai is, is right, but I don't think the details matters. I think that what We're matters, not... no, no, I think what matters is what comes out of the details. And I think the story that they tell from their perspective is more important than what actually happened. And I think all those people, all those, they were all, all my grandparents. Those, this is the generation of my grandparents. 
and they're all in the way post-traumatic. Okay, I think this is the main issue for me, not whether there was a truck with a speaker or not. That's for, the truth? I think the truth is Multi an aspect. One, one more word. Our aim wasn't to, to create a historical film. We didn't come to tell a truth. We don't have a truth to tell about what happened. We brought the, the evidence of, the, of what the people that fought there said. We're not, we didn't distort anything they said. We, didn't, we, brought both, we brought both sides of the story as well. So we're not arguing about the details, and I'm sure the BBC has a narrative that is truthful as well. And in order for the conversation, actually, I think everything you've said is beautiful, and hopefully our conversation will progress from here instead of getting stuck on details. Um, I will also say that we've, we've heard ever since I've seen this film and we've been talking to researchers, you could hear from the Arab and from the Jewish side two different versions. Arabs that say that there was, Arabs that say that there wasn't, um, Jews that say that there was, Jews that say that there wasn't. It's really, there are different perspectives and I don't think the film gives you a final answer at all. And it sounds like the filmmakers are not saying that they have, even though they might have their own private opinions, um, personal opinions. We're not going to get there tonight. Um, I think what, what really um, will be interesting is actually um, the elements that we can learn from this film that I think uh, the film presents very well. With that said, comments and questions that might lead us to that. We'll uh, take one right here. Thank you. I want to know how this has been received in Israel. The film uh, was screened in, it was premiered in the Jerusalem Film Festival and then was screened in Channel 8 and is going to be screened uh, in other festivals around the world, uh, here in France and Barcelona. It was received mostly very well. I mean, we heard a lot of opinions, but uh, all the, the participants that are still alive watched the films and they were very, very excited and um, to get their feedback, they, they got, you know, various feedbacks basically from people who are agreed with the film and the, uh, with, from people that didn't agree with the film, but mostly it was received very well. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is details. Um, two questions. The first, I, I mean, I know the difference, but I think that it needs to be explained, and maybe you should explain to some people in the audience the difference between Lehi and Haganah, because I think people don't know. And the other question is, were there no um, Arab survivors to also interview for the film? Those are my two questions. Um, okay, so the differences in general that the Haganah is the more mainstream underground movement, it was like... Um, Later, it became the IDF, so it's like the mainstream of, uh, of the Israeli uh, undergrounds. And Lehi and Irgun were both like um, more right wings, more, very small, very smaller. So the Lehi were like 200 to 250 people. Um, and they considered to be very, very radical in a way. And um, this is the main issue, I think. And till 1977, till the... Likud, the Likud party, the right-wing party, came to power. The Irgun and Lehi considered to be very outcast in Israel. So the main, um, the um, yeah. So this is question one. Uh, there are a few uh, Palestinian survivors that were uh, shot to this film, were interviewed to this film, but uh, we decided to take them out actually in the editing room um, because we thought that this story should be. Uh, the story about Israel, about Israelis in a way, and not to deal with um, what really happened in the massacre or in the village, what the, ex the exact events that took place in Deir Yassin is less important, I think. We, we bound to stay close or to bound to stay true, but uh, I think this is not the main issue of the film. And I think this is a sh ish the film is um, for Israelis, about Israelis, and deals with Israeli perspective of, of things. So this is why we uh, took them out, actually. We have a question up here. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Josh. Uh, thank you very much. It was a really powerful movie. Um, I just wanted to note that um, 
Right now in the United States with a lot of the white supremacist movements, there are chants of, of blood and soil and, and the, 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 the Irgun anthem that, that that man was singing was just really horrifying and very, I think, timely for what's going on in the United States now. Um, my question is, um, when I see this movie, I, I have feelings um, that, that this is like a Holocaust movie. Um, and I wanted to know, and, and I feel trouble, you know, I'm not entirely sure if I'm comfortable with the fact that, that I just said that because, you know, are the Nakba and the Holocaust, can we compare, can we compare them? Were these things that, that you as, as filmmakers grappled with um, as, you, as you were making the film? Uh, you want to answer? We don't think, I don't think there is a place to compare between the Holocaust and this film. We do think as a filmmakers, and that, that was the base of us making the film, that there is a place to confess about things that happened and tell the stories that happens. And it will help us as a country and as a people to move forward and to uh, make, uh, I don't know if, if peace is the right word, but to, uh, to acknowledge that this was the story of the beginning of Israel. It, I don't think there is a place to, to compare, uh, but I think the stories need to be tell, told. I have a question up here. Um, my question is more of a filmmaking choice, so it's pretty detailed instead of the big issues. But I will say that I thought your um, depiction of just the vulnerability of human beings on all sides was extraordinary and, and very haunting. I really appreciated it. So my question was the last bit with Dror, and um, it seemed a very self-conscious uh, move to have him filming, filmed on the ground behind a fence at night. And I was wondering if you could comment on the um, choice and symbolism of that. I think that, um I think that the, the main issue for, or the main um, reason for this scene is, I think you, you can't really tell where the camera is, whether we're outside or inside the fence in a way. So we kind of wanted the audience to try to wonder for themselves whether Draw is inside or outside the mental institute in a way, and whether Hannah, the, the mother, is outside or inside. So this is why the scene was shot in that way. Um, the, the night, of course, and the night atmosphere and uh, really contributes the, the ending um, kind of feeling that this scene has. I think we knew that when Neta, the director, went to interview uh, Draw, this will be probably the end of the film in, in some way. We didn't know, of course, where it's going to be located in the film, but we had a sense that this is the right place for it. So I think this is why we put it... Uh, in that location, and, we, and, and again, in, during the night, during the evening. So, yeah. Hi. Um, I also have found the film very powerful, and I appreciate the effort that was made to put it together and bring it to us. Um, this is also a little bit of a detailed question about the, the film and the people in the film. There was the man who, the one time where we saw Neta, she, was, she came and sat at the table. So that man, and he... He asked her earlier on, why are you asking me these questions? And she said, are you upset? And she, he was also the only one who was referring to her by name. So I'm curious if, if they're related or knew each other from before or no? No, uh, but Neta came to, his name is Shimon, Shimon Moneta. He just passed away like uh, a month ago, um, just before the screen in Jerusalem. So it's like two months now. Um, Neta and Shimon went, uh, came to, very close during the filming of this movie. Uh, it took Neta around four years of shooting all together and research. So she came to meet uh, Shimon, I think around five or six times, different times. And actually you can't really see it in the film, but he's wearing different shirts every time. So, but it was all shot during uh, different periods. And then in the end we found the, the letter, the Lehi archive, so we came again. Uh, and they became very close. I think he had um, 
I, I believe I don't want to put words in, in his mouth, but I think he had a secret he wanted to share. And I think um, this is the closest he can get by willing to participate and willing to take really active part in this film. Um, this and is have, what, what film. They had very close relationship. They were like, uh, she always said that he's like her gra grandfather to her. They were very close and he really uh, had a lot of confidence in her. So um, he felt very comfortable interviewing for the, fil for the film and sharing and, and f being filmed, uh, I think, f five or six times different sessions. Yeah. To, to follow up on that, what was Netta's connection? How did she come about the story? How did you all come about this story? And did, did it start with Dror? Did it start, was there, what was the connection to all of us? Uh, no, Netta is a graduate from the Bezalel uh, Art uh, uh, School in Jerusalem. It's a very high uh, school art in Jerusalem. And her major uh, project was uh, photo still, stills of Kfar Shaul, combined with um, lines from um, uh, from uh, refugees from the village. And then afterwards, she began to ask questions about the village and about the massacre and about the events of the sin. So she began to research it and she met this one and this one. Lots of people just hang up the phone when she called, but the people in the film didn't. So this is how this story evolved in a way. And um, again, it, it took her a few years to get to all the people and to get eventually to this archive, to the Lehi archive. And Dror Dro, uh, she knew Dro from... Yeah, Dro is a very close friend of her. Mm -hmm. And when she discovered his mother was uh, hospitalized in the hospital in Kfar Shaul, uh, she knew she had to make a film about this. And um, I remember she told me that the first time she had, they want to go and meet the mother in the hospital, I think a day before that she passed away. And then... That's how the film started to to roll. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Uh, I'll try to make it fast. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. I thought it was beautifully done. And uh, historically, I'm a psychoanalyst, and I've been practicing over 50 years in New York. And for me, uh, at least two people have shown up in a practice in New York who had been hospitalized at Kafar Shaul in very uh, extreme, uh, having an extreme shape. And, in, and I'm really almost asking if this can be true. Because in order to work out some of the problems, I myself traveled to Deir Yashin. Yashin. Uh, but they said that uh, the question is why a mental hospital was built on this site so few years after the massacre. I mean, less than five years. And that it's true that Yad Vashem looks straight down in this valley. So it really seems bizarre. It's over symbolic. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, but, but the question, so the, my patient said that she heard, um, she heard stories from the doctors about the whole, she was only 12. I have to get to the question. And, oh. and from a Arab orderlies about what had happened in the Nakba. Could that be true in terms of people who work there? I think so. I, th I think uh, they have Arab employees, and maybe some of them, I, I'm not, I can't say for sure, but I know they have still Arabs that works in the hospital. So, Folks, we need to end in a moment. I'm sure the conversation can continue outside and beyond. I want to say one teeny anecdote to close. Um, I started off my day today um, as part of um, the New York um, mayor for another four years, mayor's team that deals with mental health. And a group of about 40 clergy members met with some key psychiatrists to talk about what New York City is doing right for mental health, what New York City has not been doing right for mental health, and how faith communities can do better and help. And one of the stark admissions by a key mental health professional in the city was that there are decades for which the city is deeply regretful of how people were dealt in the city and in this country, from lobotomies to forced treatments to ways that it was not how today we understand the fragility of human life and the dignity of all people. And what the doctors and officials said this morning 
we're telling those stories now so we cannot repeat them, so we can be better for each other, so we can do a better job. So starting the day with that and ending the day with this, may we take whatever we take from this film, not to blame and not to point at the past, but learn to be honest, to be sensitive, to be real, and make this world, Israel here, better. And art can serve a very important role in that. So thank you for helping us rise to that.